think we're going. Okie dokie. So just a couple of things for the record before we get properly starting. We have apologies from Bexley, Kingston, Lewisham and Richmond. And just a couple of general reminders. If we could keep our phones on silent, that would be fabulous. And just a reminder that the photo and travel consent forms on your desk, we'd really appreciate it if you could get those in as soon as possible. That would be brilliant. And just in case of any emergencies, if you follow the officers, they will show you where to go. But if we just start by going around, um, just for the record, saying your name and what borough you're from. Yeah, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Theo Sergio, and I'm representing Enfield. Um, um, hi, my name is Hannah Lamela, and I'm representing Southwark. I'm Devon Dara, and I represent Lambeth. I'm Temi, and I represent Greenwich. Hi, I'm Emily Warnham, and I represent Bromley. Hi, I'm Helen, I represent Sutton. Hi, I'm Luke St. Clair, and I represent Wandsworth. Hi, I'm Manette Wallison, and I represent Merton. My name is Jatta Gutapai, and I represent Hounslow. Hi, I'm Rainey, and I represent Waltham Forest. Hey, I'm Sadia, and I represent Tower Hamlets. Hi, I'm Tyba, and I represent Redbridge. Hi, I'm Daisy, and I represent Havering. Hi, I'm Safia, I represent Harringay. Hello, I'm Sky Fitzgerald McShane, and I represent Hackney. Hello, I'm Gabby, and I represent Noom. Um, hi, I'm Ashley, and I represent Barking and Dagenham. Hi, I'm Rihanna. I represent Kensington and Chelsea. Hi, I'm Mariam and I represent Hillingdon. Hi, I'm Emma and I represent Hammersmith and Fulham. Hi, I'm Abu and I represent Camden. Hi, I'm Basha and I represent Brett. Hi, I'm Tanya and I represent Barnet. Brilliant, thanks everyone. So before we really get cracking, I just wanted to say that this meeting is very much the beginning. From this point onwards, there really is no limit to what we can achieve. The journey to this meeting began in this very room, where I saw the difference that could be made by working together across London, because there really is no other community quite like London. The GLA itself was proposed and brought to fruition 18 years ago, based on two principal documents, a voice for London and new leadership for London. Today we progress both those ideas, with new youth leadership for London and new youth voice for London. In another 18 years time, history will recognise this day as the moment when those founding ideas were expanded to change the future of London forever. And we're part of that. Let's make sure that history does look back and celebrate the achievements we make. Today's meeting is the first of many to come. We have the opportunity to shape the future of our city. Let's make sure that we do so with the dignity, professionalism and integrity we expect to see from our politicians. Which brings us rather nicely onto our code of conduct. Was everyone happy with the code of conduct? Did anyone have anything they wanted to change, or were we kind of happy with that as a basis for a rolling document? Yeah, fabulous. Okie dokie. So, as I described earlier, the reason that this project was taken on board and pushed forward to where it is today is because of the drive, passion, and expertise of our first speaker, who has served as the Assembly Member for Bexley and Bromley for the last 10 years. Incredibly involved in the Assembly, our next speaker is Chair of the Budget and Performance Committee, the Budget Monitoring Subcommittee, the GLA Oversight Committee, as well as being a member of the Confirmations Hearing Committee and the Fire Resilience and Emergency Planning Committee. Please can we give a huge LYA welcome to Assembly Member Bacon. Well, um, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, welcome to all of you to City Hall. Um, Katie's been a bit, uh, she's exaggerated my uh, involvement in this, I think, uh, a little bit. It's very nice to hear, but actually it's, it's not quite the truth. Um, I had a very peripheral role in this. Um, much of the, the work that went into this came from Katie herself. Um, she came up and shadowed me a couple of years ago um, for a few days here at City Hall and she got to sort of see all the nooks and crannies and all the meetings and things that we do. Uh, she got to meet the mayor, just about over there, who was kind enough to uh, allow her to have a photo taken with him. But the original concept to do a London Youth Assembly came directly from Katie. Um, she wrote me a, a paper which she sent to me to see what I thought of it. Uh, and I thought it was a great idea because when Katie says that uh, you can shape the future of London, you are the future of London. And actually, it's a future that gets neglected far too often. Uh, and listening to young people's voices in here, I think, is an incredible thing to do. So I pushed the paper along uh, within City Hall, and we had to twist a few arms to get people to take it seriously. But there are two other people that were absolutely integral to making today's events happen and taking this forward. And they're both far too modest to, to uh, take a bow, but I would encourage them to do so. 
uh, and that's Ed Williams, who is walking around over there pretending he's not listening to me, um, and uh, George Abbott, who is sitting next to him. Without these two City Hall officers, you wouldn't be here now. Uh, and so I think you should show your appreciation for them. We are also here at the blessing of, of the Mayor of London. This is not uh, the Young Mayor's Assembly, it's the uh, Young uh, London Assembly, the London Youth Assembly. Um, but we can't use the building without the Mayor's permission, um, so sometimes this will go against my grain, but we should give the Mayor a round of applause as well. <laughs> Kate has asked me in my opening remarks to just give you a flavour of what the London Assembly is, what it is that we do here. Um, and I don't know how much uh, you guys are aware of what we do, so um, some of this you may know, some of it you may not. Uh, there are 25 London Assembly members, uh, and they're elected in two different ways. 14 of us are elected in constituencies, just like members of Parliament, but very large constituencies. <clears throat> so my constituency is Bexley and Bromley, which is the boroughs of Bexley and Bromley. Roughly 600,000 people live in my constituency, and on a bad day it takes an hour and a half to drive from one end of it to the other. Uh, but my constituency is roughly typical of the other 13 in terms of size and the number of people that live within it. The other 11 Assembly members are elected via a form of proportional representation through party lists. And the outcome of that is that there are five different political parties represented uh, within the London Assembly. I'll give you the split as well in case you're interested. There are 12 Labour members, eight Conservatives, two Greens, two UKIP, uh, and one Liberal Democrat. And our job, our main aim, uh, our reason for being, is to scrutinise the Mayor of London and everything that he does. Uh, now, within that, it's not just him, but it's all of the functional bodies that sit beneath him. So that would be the police, that's fire, uh, that's some of the regeneration work that he does, uh, and a whole range of other things. And you'll hear from Sophie Linden, who is the Deputy Mayor for Policing. Uh, we scrutinise her as well, and all of his appointees. We do that in a number of different ways. The, the, the most public way that we do it is what we were doing in this room this morning, which is Mayor's Question Time. Uh, which takes place 10 times a year. Uh, it's a very long meeting, takes about two and a half hours. Uh, this morning we had the added ex excitement of a fire alarm, so we all had to go and stand outside in the freezing cold for 45 minutes, which doesn't normally happen, but uh, does happen occasionally. Um, but most of the work that we do is through committees, and we have a whole range of subject specialist committees uh, that cover all of the main functions of the mayor and a few others as well that are of particular interest to Londoners. Um, we do that very much on a cross-party basis, and one of the things that uh, I agreed that I would emphasize today is that the support for setting this organisation up, the London Youth Assembly, is very much a cross-party thing. All of my colleagues on the Assembly, regardless of party, were very, very enthusiastic about setting this up. Some of them are in the gallery uh, today. Uh, some of them have had to submit apologies, but you have the support of all 25 members here, and I think that's very important. A lot of the work that we do is also cross-party. The reports that we publish, the investigations that we do into mayoral policy, tend to get published with the support of all parties taking part, on occasions we disagree with the outcome and sometimes that there will be dissenting reports. But by and large, most of what we do is done in a very consensual way. Um, surprisingly, politicians of different parties actually get on quite well behind the scenes. You might not think it if you see us in public, but behind the scenes, we're all on first name terms, we all get on rather well. And I think that's to the benefit of London um, because we approach things more or less in the same way. We generally agree about the outcomes we want to find. It's the journey getting to the outcome is where we will disagree on. So I'd like to sort of close really by um, congratulating the one group of people that I haven't yet congratulated for setting this up, and that is, of course, each and every one of you. Uh, I'm tremendously encouraged to find so many people who've bought into this idea. I can remember the, the paper that arrived in my inbox uh, without any warning, which seems like quite a while ago now. Um, for this to have taken off in this way, for you all to be here, the main, main members, your deputies who are here as well, your parents who've come along, you should all be very, very proud um, of yourselves um, you're very proud of this uh, initiative that you're taking forward, and I hope very much that you establish it on London's political map and take it forward way in, way, way into the future. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Did anyone have any questions that they wanted to raise to Assemblymember Bacon? Why don't you tell us about some of the committees that you sit on and what they do? Okay, um, the one that meets most frequently is the Police and Crime Committee, and the job of that is to scrutinise the Metropolitan Police and the Mayor's Office for Policing and Crime. Uh, as I said before, it's cross-party. It's currently chaired by a Conservative, um, Assemblymember Steve O'Connell. Um, and that, as you can imagine, has been a very busy committee uh, over the last uh, year, two years. We've seen a, a massive rise in uh, violent crime in London uh, and police budgets under intense pressure. 
Um, the next most busy committee probably is the Transport Committee. Um, one of the biggest parts of the Mayor's budget is the Transport for London budget, um, which covers buses, tubes, um, some overground trains, trams, etc. Uh, and it's absolutely vital, not just getting people to and from work, but vital for London's economy, also for housing and other infrastructure. Um, the Budget and Performance Committee, which I chair, is quite a good one because it, budget goes through everything. Nothing can happen unless you spend money. And that gives me a license to stick my nose into everything that's going on in this building and everything that the Mayor does. And that's quite an interesting committee. We also have committees on things like the environment, the economy. We have a health committee, an education committee. I'm sure I think we missed anything. We've got a, a Brexit committee, although we don't call it that. We call it the EU Exit Working Group uh, and various others as well. So it's quite an involved thing. And as I say, some of the output that we have is, is, is quite useful in terms of shining a light, not just on what the Mayor's up to, but things that are happening in London that matter to people. I'm sure everyone... Yeah, Emily? Um, so, obviously, there are all these different committees going on, and in the future, do you, how do you think that we would be able to influence these committees, and what impact do you think that we, as a youth assembly, could have? Well, it's a very interesting question. Um, at the moment, it's a blank sheet of paper. I think one of the things that we could certainly do is that when we're calling for evidence on things, um, we can consult you. Um, I don't know how you're going to organise yourselves internally, but I think that that would be an interesting thing to do. Um, one of my colleagues, um, I will name check him, um, Andrew Boff, who's there, um, has come up with the idea that we may need to go away and talk about this, of maybe um, on a certain number of occasions during the year, you come and give evidence either at committees or indeed um, get a seat and a, an opportunity to ask questions at Mayor's Question Time. Um, that, I think, is quite a, an interesting and exciting proposal, and I think that that's, we'd have to go away and work on that. Um, but I think things like that could be a very viable way forward. Um, to, uh, question about what you do already. Uh, to what extent do you consult the public, and in what ways do you do that? A variety of different ways. Um, mayoral strategies, uh, as, as distinct from the Assembly, have to be consulted on before they, they can be passed. Uh, the Assembly reaches out to all sorts of different interested groups uh, for all of the investigations that we do. Uh, we take evidence from people, so we don't just sit around a table and talk to each other. We bring people in, a bit like parliamentary select committees, uh, and we will take evidence from them there. So for youth issues, you may very well find in the future that we call on some of you uh, to come in and give evidence to committees as well. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Okay. Okay. Right. Um, I, unfortunately, I've got to go to a, a, an event in my constituency this afternoon, so I can't stay for much longer. So can I just, before I go, mm -hmm. before he bounces me out of the building, um, I'd like to wish you all the very, very best of luck. Um, congratulations on this new venture. I think it's tremendous. You should be very proud of yourselves, and I hope it's something that co goes on to be a very great success. Thank you very much, and have a good rest of your meeting. <laughs> So on the back of our update forms, our next speaker has an incredibly important role as Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime and has been incredibly generous with her time to be here today. Her role covers the delivery of the Police and Crime Plan, working with the Met and driving crime reduction across the capital. Here today with a focus on knife crime and youth violence, can we please welcome Deputy Mayor Sophie Linden. Yeah, thank you very much and thank you very much for inviting me. It's, um, it's a real pleasure to be here for your first meeting of the London Youth Assembly. I must admit, I was just saying to um, uh, James, who I work with, and I came in, I was like, I'm surprised. why hasn't this happened before? Because you just think the, you know, the London Assembly would have a Youth Assembly, so it's fantastic that it is now happening. I'm really pleased to be here. I'd like to think you'd ask me here because you'd heard about my uh, you know, amazing speaking skills or my fantastic jokes, but I know it's because <laughs> violence is the key issue for, well, for London, but especially for young Londoners. But I just um, wanted to thank you, Katie. As I understand it was your idea and you've pushed and driven this through, which is a fantastic achievement that here we are in City Hall. Thank so you. well done. But I just also wanted to say it's really good to see so many young people active, engaged, and in politics. And um, I don't mean party politics, and I'm not getting party political. It really is such an important thing that young people feel that, one, they should get involved, and they can get involved, and that their voices, your voices, can make a difference, and can make a difference especially to London. I got involved in politics really young. I grew up in a political family. I, I started my, I, was, I remember as a child, leafleting for my mum and trying, you know, pushing leaflets through doors. I joined a political party at the um, age of 16, and I've worked in politics for a very long time. And because I, I hope like you, absolutely believe that if you get involved, 
you have a vision, you know what you want to change, you can make a real difference. And it's that that I'm really inspired by, the fact that you're here, because getting involved and engaging does matter. And there are too many people, I feel, think, get switched off politics because of the, you know, the toing and froing and the fighting, when actually politics is absolutely vital for changing people's lives. For me, getting involved in politics means that you can change Londoners' lives, and that's why I got involved in Hackney as a councillor, and I'm so pleased to be the Deputy Mayor for Policing and Crime. Although I have to say it is really, really, it's really difficult times at the moment. It's tough times in London and across the country because you'll know, you'll have seen it in the press and no doubt you will. You've come from communities, your families and your neighbours that have been affected by violence and affected by violent crime. It's, um, it's rising in London, but it's rising in England and Wales as well. And I just wanted to say to you that for me and for the Mayor, tackling violent crime is really... It's absolute top priority, but it's also really personal. I, I went to school in Hackney. I, you know, I, I'm, I have four children who have grown up in Hackney, so it's really personal. When communities are affected by knife crime and violence, I live in those communities. They're my neighbours, they're my friends. Like they're your neighbours and they're your friends. And that's absolutely crucial and vital that we tackle that. So today I just wanted to touch on a couple of things that we are doing from here in City Hall, working with the Metropolitan Police... Um, and working with the Metropolitan Police and also working with partners and boroughs. I've just got a note saying London Needs Your Life is ready to play. I was going to play it at the end, is that all right? <laughs> so, um, so there is a real challenge in tackling serious violence in London and across the country because there is no one... It's not one thing that you can pull a lever and that will change what's happening. It is a really complex problem, a complex problem around people's... Uh, needs, uh, poverty, social alienation, aspirations. Um, so it is really complex, and that's why myself and the mayor have set out a uh, what's called a public health approach to tackling violence and setting up a violence reduction unit, because we know that the police can't arrest their way out of this problem. The Metropolitan Police are incredibly important in, in for being out there at the moment, arresting people, and enforcing against those who are prepared to do bad things and to hurt people and to stab people and to murder people. And that's absolutely right. The Mayor has um, put uh, £15 million into the Metropolitan Police to uh, develop a violent crime task force. And they are out there in the, uh, in the boroughs of London that have the worst problems. And they're out there day in, day out, arresting people, uh, taking knives off the streets. They've made nearly, over, uh, nearly 1,800 arrests taken hundreds of knives off the, off the streets through weapon sweeps and also taken offensive weapons and guns. So they are part of, absolutely part of getting on top of the problem and making sure that we can really get on top of the absolutely unacceptable level, level of murders that we have. 50 under 25s have lost their lives this year, uh, 22 teenagers, and that is shocking and absolutely unacceptable. And we really, the police have a very major part, a role to play in that. But they're not the only people that can make, make a difference here because what we've got to do is make sure that we prevent and stop those people who are on the road to committing violence, on the road to criminality and crime. How do we help and support them not to make those wrong decisions, not to get into the position where they feel they have to carry a knife or that they feel that they are unable to do anything but commit violence and not to be in the position where they are being groomed for gangs or groomed for what's called county lines to take drugs out of London and outside of London to, um, to uh, sell them outside of London. And to do that, it's what we call the public health approach, and that's why we are setting up and in the process of rapidly setting up a violence reduction unit, which will absolutely work with communities, with young people, but also with all the 32 boroughs in London, the NHS, and crucially with mental health services, because uh, they, many of the young people are not... Uh, giving, letting them off the hook, people that commit the really terrible violence because it's, you know, they have to, have to take personal responsibility as well. But we also know that there are many mental health issues that are causing some of these violence, this violence where there are victims who haven't had their trauma properly dealt with and properly been able to recover. So the Violence Reduction Unit will build on what we are already doing. We published a knife crime strategy last June and that very much talked about early intervention, working with schools, trying to get to the bottom of why so many young people, especially young black boys, are being excluded. 
and why that looks, why it's such a, such a driver into crime for people that, who don't have permanent places in school and are not having the education that they should be having. But as I said, that's part of the work that we are doing. The Mayor has put half a million pounds aside for the Violence Reduction Unit, but that is on top of the money that has been put into uh, the Mayor's L Young Londoners Fund. There's £45 million pounds over three years to, enable, to, put, to put, um, enable local community groups and local charities, as well as local authorities working with uh, groups like that, to provide different um, to provide activities for young people. It's brilliant. Some of the programmes that have been, have been funded is there's a fishing programme, there's a, you know, taking young people fishing, there's a boxing programme, uh, there's uh, arts, culture, music. They're right the spectrum of what young people might be interested in because I'm very aware with four, four young, uh, young, for, for children who are now young adults that everybody's very different and have very different ideas about, and interests about what all they'll get involved in. But what I wanted to say to you as well is that it isn't just myself and the Mayor and the Met and those sort of um, in, in authority and in positions, statutory organisations like boroughs, that need to work together. It is with the communities and young people. So that Mayor's Young Londoners Fund was, um, it, we had young people come here in City Hall, they, the tables were set out here on, in, the, in, in the chamber and they graded and marked the bids for who wanted, who, people that were bidding to get money. And they, it really did make a difference in terms of what they said about the bids, made a difference to who got the money. So it's that sort of what's called co-production and working together, hearing always the voice of young people. We, um, the Metropolitan Police and boroughs now, in every borough there's a knife crime action plan, which is there to look at, yes, what the police can do and what they should be doing, and the stop and search that they should be doing to get weapons off the street, but also how they work with everybody else in the borough and those plans have involved young people as well. They, there's one where they, um, a borough has involved young people in when there are issues in the community, they do a, what's called a community tensions assessment and they have involved young people in provide, asking them, how are you feeling about what's going on in the community? What is happening? So they're part of the response as well. And that's incredibly important to make sure that they are part of the response. Um, there's a lot to talk about in terms of what else we're doing in tackling violence um, and the work we've done with Ofsted in schools. We've also, which I'll show you in a minute, I hope some of you will have already seen, launched the London Needs Your Life campaign. Again, that was, that was developed with young people and by young people and listening to what they wanted to hear, uh, what they, the type of messages they thought would help. And it is a, um, I think it's a fantastic video and a really good campaign in terms of absolutely about how the positive contribution that young people make to London. Because I'm always very aware that often in my job, I spend a lot of time talking about all the difficulties, all the, all the things that go wrong, the violence that is committed. And that is by a very small proportion of people, uh, young adults, young people, adults. Uh, and we've always got to remember that actually what makes London so fantastic is one, it's diversity, but two, the fantastic young people. because. Uh, the, and the vibrancy, and I think that's what comes out in the video that I'll play you in a minute. Just also wanted to touch on, in terms of violence and violence reduction, and the role of um, City Hall and the role of the Metropolitan Police and the Violence Reduction Unit, is for me, yes, of course, it's about the street violence that we're seeing at the moment and tackling the gangs that, we, that are causing not all of the violence, but some of the most severe violence that we're seeing. Um, but it's also incredibly important that we don't forget and we always remember and make sure that we are also tackling the violence that many women and young women are, are experiencing. So it's about the violence in the home, but it's also about the sexual violence that young women uh, are experiencing as well. Because if we don't tackle that, we aren't tackling violence as a whole. Um, for, for one reason, we know that from research and from the evidence that we see, that many people that go on to commit violence one of the things that's happened to them in their life is that they've been witnesses, they've, been, they've experienced violence themselves in the home. So for me, yes, it is absolutely a priority around street violence, but we have also got to tackle the domestic violence and the sexual violence and some of the um, abuse that young women are experiencing, um, quite serious sexual violence that they're experiencing at the moment with increased reports, but also, actually, I, I, I am very concerned that we're seeing increased incidents around it as well. We have to do both. And for me, the scope of the Violence Reduction Unit is to prioritise street violence, but to have within its scope, absolutely, 
domestic violence and sexual violence as well. So um, there's much more I could talk to you about, but I thought it would be good to have a discussion and questions. But if you don't mind, I'd really like to play the London Needs You Live video just to give you a flavour of the campaign and to remember that it was, it's, these are genuine young people that made the video, developed the campaign and is a positive voice for London. I make this eat. I'm the energy. The colour. The force. The voice. <laughs> the noise you can't turn off. Nothing moves forward without me. I'm the big man beyond the small years. I'm the listener, the learner, the leader. The funny man. The wise man. The man of the house. Oh, I want to be the next thing. To shot people forward. To turn heads. Lose minds. Leave oh, oh, oh. Stop oh, laughing, man. <laughs> All right. I am this postcode, this city. I am important. My friends will miss me if I'm gone. I'm like the funniest person in the school. My mum needs me alive. She needs me alive. My boys need me alive. London needs me alive. London needs me alive. London needs me alive. So I don't carry a knife. So I don't carry a knife. Who wants to kick off with the first question? Yep. Yes. Yeah. So as you were saying, that. There so are I was, no worries. Start no again. Worries. I was picking up no my So, as you were saying, there are increased reports in violent crime, but for many reasons, there are also many people that, for for various reasons, they don't report um, violent crime or being a victim. So, I was wondering, what do you think could be done to help those people speak out about their experiences or be aware that they are in fact victims? Do you want to? Yeah. Just want to. Um, you're right that there's, I, I, my worry is always that the, in terms of the reporting of crime, the recorded crime and the stats that we all look at um, are just part of the picture and that actually underneath that there are many victims and many young people who are experiencing just different levels of crime and different levels of violence as well and they don't report it and that can be for a number of reasons and for me that comes, you know, at the heart of that is around um, trust and confidence in the police. And, you know, is it worth them? Do they think, with one reporting, do they trust the police that there will, something will happen and, um, and that there will be, you know, a sufficient response? And is it easy to contact the police? So in terms of that trying to develop trust and confidence, that is a long-term process. Because I'm, they, when you look at the, uh, I, which we do, which I do, we have a survey around public confidence you can see that actually public confidence in the police is high, but when you look below it, it isn't. There are real differences in um, in terms of ethnic minorities, young black men, uh, and also those with disabilities and their trust and confidence in the police. So for me, it is about that. And the ways that we're trying to de to develop that is one to have schools officers to have an officer, a named officer for every school. We've got about 300, met just above 300 metropolitan police schools officers that work. So that the first time that a young person has an, any interaction with the police isn't necessarily either a stop and search or when it's you know something has gone wrong that you actually can develop that relationship. But we are also um, and it's that's also around the neighbourhood policing with having putting two dedicated ward officers into every ward. That is to increase that engagement and increase that confidence. Neighbourhood policing is so important for that. But we also do keep a track of what violence that isn't being reported because we have a programme called um, Information Sharing to Tackle Violence which is where often people that um, don't report violence they will go and get their injuries treated um, and we share that information anonymised, we don't know who they are but we can see where there are fluctuations and see whether there are differences so we are keeping track of that as well Leading on from that, I was just wondering um, how effective do you think the current stop and search strategy is and um, what are the limitations facing it? So, I mean, myself and the Mayor have always been really clear that we think stop and search is a useful 
tool that works and the police, especially now with where there's serious violence and um, areas of high violence, they should be using uh, that tactic. They should be using stop and search, but they should be using it in a targeted, intelligence-led way and it should be done professionally. And we, we can't go back to the old days when it was just blanket stop and search, but they should absolutely be using that in terms of making sure that they are stopping and searching those people, that they have the intelligence that they, you know, and have the reasonable, reasonable grounds for stopping and searching, because they are, they are doing that and we are getting a lot of hundreds of weapons off the streets through that. It is increasing at the moment, stop and search, and we're also seeing the number of stop and search for weapons um, uh, increasing as well. I support that because we are in a situation where there is just too much violence on the streets, but I support it when it's done professionally. And we have a lot of layers of accountability around that. It is, we, it's very, there are, you know, I, I look at stop and search figures, you can very clearly see where there are po what's called positive outcomes, where there has been an arrest um, or a different type of outcome. And this is about running at about 30%, and that's roughly the same, uh, has been the same for a while. So we have got quite good positive outcomes around stop and search. But I do also recognise that if it's done badly or if it's done in the wrong way or in, you know, without the right intelligence, it can cause a lot of tension. I've spoken to many young people who feel that they have been unfairly picked on by the police. And we've got to really guard against that. But I do think stop and search at the moment is a useful tool. So any questions? Guy, yeah, do you want to go? So, yeah, I just want to say quickly, I am from Hackney, um, and I think and I've been personally um, seeing the effects of knife crime, and I think it's important, and I really like the fact you mentioned the, both the preventative strategy being important, more, maybe more, even more so than the reactive strategy, but also factoring mental health, men, factoring in mental health and things like that. But my question is really, um, sometimes lots of boroughs in Hackney, so like lots of young people in Hackney, um, get a bad, it's a really negative stereotype, especially recently since the um, media impact of knife crime reporting. Um, lots of people's image of places where there's high levels of crime, even not knife crime, uh, different types of violence. Um, are you doing anything to sort of, on both on not just preventing, but also sorting out the stereotypes and people's image of these places? Mm -hmm. No, I, I, mean, I, I, I mean, that's one of the reasons we had the London New Deal Live and why it's a positive image and it's a positive, it's a positive message about young people. And that was very deliberate because... We heard from young people, such as yourself, saying exactly that to us when we were developing the campaign, that they were tired that the only <coughs> images you see of young people um, are really negative, and the only time young people, especially young black men, have been discussed is in a negative way when there's been real problems and real difficulties. So that really was what's behind the London Needs Your Life campaign. Um, and I think that we, you know, so that is part of the messages behind that around positive. In terms of positive role models, I think there is a real issue in terms of making sure that there are positive role models, not just for young men, but for young women as well, and that they can see where young men and young women who have been you know, living in the same um, circumstances as themselves have achieved and have gone on to really achieve. And there are many schools that do that, that bring in you know, local people to, to, give, to give talks, and we really support that type of uh, that work. And the Young Londoners Fund is really, some of the programmes within that has men, have mentoring um, and work like that with young people to enable them to see those you know, positive images and positive outcomes that can be overwhelming sometimes in terms of where you're, where you're living and growing up. Yeah, we are much um, So you mentioned how uh, you plan on putting in more school officers to gain more trust. So what do you plan on doing for those young people who is trust within the police have completely been shattered and how to rebuild it? So that's, I mean, that is a really difficult question and a really difficult, it's, I don't underestimate the scale of the, scale of the, you know, how difficult that is if you have got to, got to the point of real breakdown. And I know there are some people that are like that. I've met them and talked to them quite a lot around, you know, times that they have been stopped and searched or feel that they've been really unfairly treated by the police. So part of, part of it is around schools officers and neighbourhood officers, but actually it is also about 
showing that the, the you know the, those tactics have changed. The stop and search is not done in that way anymore. And it's not blanket stop and search. But there's also a challenge back for young people as well: is how can you help in terms of? And I don't mean this flippantly at all. But you know, what is it that would be most appropriate? What's the best way of getting those messages across? And how can you, as a London Youth Assembly, say? Actually, this isn't just about the police showing that they've, you know, that they want to develop relationships. It's also about creating, creating the forums and the atmosphere and the ability for young people to also to talk to the talk to the police and to be engaged engaged in those activities as well. It's both sides that I know that the, you know, both sides need to be willing and the police are absolutely willing. We are working with young people all the time to try to improve that. But where it's really broken down, I think we need we need to have. You know, and this is the difficulty, you need youth workers, you need people who, who they do trust, uh, who young people do trust and have that trusting relationship um, to, be, to be there as advocates as well so that that can, that can develop and grow. But you'll know that youth services in London have been decimated. There are very few youth workers out there. They can do fabulous jobs and fabulous work with young people, but we, there are very few of them out there now engaging in outreach and out there on the streets. Um, just a quick introduction question. Have you heard of something called the uh, Youth Violence Commission? Yes. Um, so, just for anyone who doesn't know what the Youth Violence Commission is, it is um, it's a commission created by MP Vicky Foxcroft from Lewisham uh, through consultation for young people. So it's drafted with the help of young people and it's a true representation of what a large group of young people think. It, it aims at not just the idea of money for the policing, but an idea to uh, go into schools and have the same support that you've discussed. Uh, now, my question to you is, how is City Hall, if, uh, do they, are they agreeing with the proposals made? And if so, how they implemented it? And if, if not, why not? Uh -huh. um, so, yeah, I mean, the Youth Finance Commission, in fact, we, MOPAC funded the Youth Finance Commission to begin with, uh, not completely, but gave them a grant because um, it was a cross-party commission, as you know, founded by Vicky Foxcroft, but it's cross-party in not just London. So, and I've been working with her in terms of the, the, um, the recommendations within the report that have, I think it was published in September. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in terms of the work that we're doing, there's nothing that, um, from that report that we would disagree with. It talked about a public health approach. We are and were doing a public health approach. It talks about um, the need for, um, one of the things it talks about is the need for more neighbourhood officers. And we absolutely agree with that. And as far as we can, are putting in more officers into the neighbourhood. Um, so I don't think there's anything. Well, there isn't anything in there we would disagree with. Um, and in fact, I would, you know, through our knife crime strategy that we published last June, we were implementing many of the things and many of the, the you know, sort of the, the focus that she's asking for. We have that focus, and we are setting up a violence reduction unit. And we had, you know, those plans were in train. So it's very much in the in the spirit of what we're doing, and we are working with them and have, have a lot of a lot of conversations and discussions with them. They may not always agree with us. I think it might be the other way around, that they may not always agree with us. Yeah. So. Emily, yeah. Um, so you mentioned a lot of youth consultation to do with certain projects, but um, myself and some other people that I've spoken to are wondering what youth consultation has happened with regards to the VRU and also with regards to the public health approach in general. Yeah, that's good. The concert, I mean, if I just may, if I may, we had the, as I mentioned before, with knife crime strategy last June, which was the, you know, the, the violence reduction unit is building on. We did a lot of, I did, and my officers did a lot of consultation with young people around that. We had specific uh, meetings with young people. I actually also went into a youth offending institute to talk to talk to young people about, you know, what had happened, what might have been different, what they might have needed that might have helped them um, take a different path. So. It's not a new thing engaging and consulting with young people. And the GLA also has a peer outreach team that are out there and have done a lot of consulting. They work with the Youth Violence Commission as well in consulting with young people. So there's been a process. And in the establishment of the uh, violence reduction unit that we're doing at the moment, we are and we will be making sure that, and really happy to take your views as well about how that might best be done. Uh, but we're working to develop that consultation with young people. We hope to have one before Christmas around that, and then also some other events as well. But it's absolutely in my mind because there's no, there's there's no point, you know. It won't be as good as it could be if we aren't listening to young people and they're not part of the process. 
Um, so there have been a lot of safeguarding officers in school for my borough. I can't speak on behalf of the other boroughs. But after many surgeries and meetings, me and many of my youth counsellors have realised that not many of the students in the school have seen them or actually spoken to them. What steps could you take for young people to actually feel safe in their schools and for them to be more, sorry, for the safeguarding officers to be more accessible towards them? The safeguarding officers? Right, yeah. Do you mean the Metropolitan Police Schools officers? Um, so there's a couple of things there, isn't there? I mean, I, I don't know what school or college you're at, but we have a named officer for every school that's not that doesn't mean it's a permanent police officer in the school all the time because we only have uh, just over 300 schools officers we are we have plans and the metropolitan police have plans to increase that we will never get to the point where every school i don't think it would be right to either because there's some schools that aren't in such a need of it um where a school has a permanent police officer so for me part of that is to increase the numbers so that you there is more time spent by police officers in the schools um, so that's one thing we need to do but it's also to make sure that when police officers are in schools that they are they are making you know what is it that they are doing and that's a conversation and a discussion that i have with um with the metropolitan police around making sure that they are they, when they are in the schools, that they're engaging with the schools, uh, the, um, the, the students within the school. I've been to schools where um, I went to a school in Brent where the school police officer had a fantastic, you could see, had a really good relationship with the teachers, a really good relationship with the pupils, the pupils knew them. Um, so it's not the same in every school, but we really need to make sure that one, we can increase the numbers to make sure that there's more more engagement and there's more, more police officers with more time in schools and further education colleges and pupil referral units because it's not just the schools that are important here but two to make sure that what they are doing is more is better engaging with young people uh, the member of youth parliament for my borough cv has put forward the public health approach to the uk youth parliament and it's had wide uh, support from the other london nyps and their constituents and it's great to see the mayor adopting this approach within his new violent reduction unit. However, the proposed violent reduction unit is a long-term strategy. When will long, uh, young Londoners start to see the violent reduction unit in operation? And in the meanwhile, what uh, actions will the mayor be taking in the short term? You're right. The violence reduction unit is about that long-term strategy. And I think you're probably uh, referring to some remarks that the mayor said about it will take a generation to really embed change. And that's what the lessons are from Glasgow. Uh, from Scotland, where they, they have a, they've had a violence reduction unit, and it was set up, and it was it's been a good ten years journey to make a real change, and that's what all the advice in setting up the violence reduction unit. We're taking advice from Glasgow. They're on the reference group with a you know and regular contact. That this is a long-term generational change, but that doesn't mean that in the short term we don't expect rapid change and a rapid improvement in the, what's happening on the streets. And that's about the Violent Crime Task Force and that's about the role of the police officers, about getting, getting out there and making sure that they're taking the weapons off the streets and taking people off the... I'm afraid I am talking about, you know, arresting people who are prepared to commit violence. That's what they say, so the short term, and I, you know, we are... The, the rate of murders is, ex, is just totally unacceptable, but underneath that, knife crime with injury is beginning to fall. But until we get the murder rate down, the number of murders down, never going to be satisfied um, so there is that short term absolutely the police officers and the mayor has supported them with extra money with the 15 million pounds I, I, I mentioned earlier so the short term absolutely a lot is happening and it is the police are out there but the violence reduction unit is sort of in my mind the violence reduction unit is the police are out there doing that enforcement but what the violence reduction unit should do is help the police because they should stop them having to enforce so often because you're stopping people going down that path and you're dealing with the reasons for the violence you're not just dealing with the symptoms and that's about that is for me the public health approach you deal with the symptoms like they do in public health and then you deal with you know you deal with the causes and then you try to stop you know you're stopping the infection and that's why it will take time to do that but it doesn't mean we're not expecting you know a significant improvement in the violence that we're seeing at the moment um, with regards to stop and search, um, I was wondering if you feel that education of young people regarding their rights with stop and search, do you think that's pivotal to the continuing to this program? I think, in terms of stop and search, I think 
young people knowing their rights is important and I think you know there's um, there's there is work being done around ensuring that young people understand what their rights are and what should happen to them if they're stop and search but also why it's not just about rights I think there's also actually there is a piece of work, and it's happening in some projects and programmes in London. There's a fantastic one that I've seen called Trading Places, where young people trade places with the police. And that's actually really good education for both sides. It's not just good for the young people, it's also good for the police officer, because they get to have a better understanding of what it feels like if you are a young person being stopped and searched. Um, so, yes, it's about rights, but it's also actually also about making sure that young people can understand some of the reasons that the, uh, the police officers are stopping and searching, uh, but that police officers also understand how young people m are feeling when they're being stopped and searched, so that the way in which they do that stop is much more pro is professional, and that there are, there are consequences for when it's not professional and it's not done right in the right way. Um, so my question is about trying to change the approach to how knife crime is viewed uh, within the system. Um, so as I understand it, in Scotland, knife crime, um, the NHS treats it as an illness. I may be wrong. And, um, and so there's a much more integrated approach where if someone has been stabbed, um, both the perpetrator and the victim um, are, are treated as, as, as if someone had a heart attack and all the necessary steps are very much integrated. How plausible would it be to integrate to implement such a system in London, and uh, if it is plausible, what steps could we take as the London Youth Assembly to try and push this forward? I mean, the Violence Reduction Unit is set up and um, to learn the lessons of what happened in Glasgow and Scotland, and that public health, as I was saying earlier, about treating it as a, as treating it as a virus, treating it as an infection, and try in dealing with it in that way, and you know, trying to get into the, the causes of why people are committing violence. And that's, there are different ways. I mean, you can't, I mean, the public health approach and what they did in Glasgow has been very, very effective. But you'll know, and I know, that Scotland is very different to London. Uh, uh, not just in size, probably, you know, probably two or, three borough, two or three of the boroughs that you're representing here tonight would make up the city of Glasgow. Very different in diversity, very different in the drivers, because in London it, was, it is much more drug-related than it was in Glasgow, in much more alcohol fueled in Glasgow uh, when they first started. So we've got, to, we've got to learn the lessons, but it's not just a sort of lift. That's what they did in Glasgow. We can do it here. But we're also learning the lessons from places like New York as well, where they've had, they have people, community workers and engagement there. But in terms of treating the victim and the perpetrator, um, and treating them and working, you know, trying to work with them about what's happened, absolutely that's part of the work that we're doing. But there's often, there isn't a straight divide always between someone being a victim and someone being a perfect, someone being the person that's actually committed the violence. There's often an overlap. Um, either they've been a victim or actually they're in a position where it's just a matter of timing or luck as to whether they've been the they are the victim or the perpetrator. But what the mayor has done is um, funded um, youth workers in accident emergency units. Um, they've re Red Thread and St Giles and Oasis are in the trauma units in, in London. So that when at that moment that a young person comes in as a victim of violence, um, there is a youth worker there to help them and to support them and support them outside in their journey when they leave the hospital as well. And we are. Uh, we are um, increasing the number of accident emergency units. We can't, we can't, there's, I think there's 28 accident emergency units in London. Unfortunately, we can't, we can't be in every accident emergency unit. We haven't got the money to do that, but we, the mayor has put money aside and is you know, making sure that we can increase the number of accident emergency units that that happens in so that we can treat it in that way as when a victim comes in, how can we try to stop and help them and intervene at that stage as well? Okay, I'm conscious of time, so I think I'm going to take two more questions, if that's right. So, Luke, do you want to go? Um, as you just said, much of the violence within London is deeply intertwined with drug use and distribution. Um, as you've done with the violence, would you consider looking at other countries that have had big initiatives towards reducing drug use and implementing that, not even just in London, but discussing that with wider, you know, with uh, the House of the Parliament and talking about ideas to which, you know, reduce drug use within London and then the rest of the UK in order to help prevent crime, especially in London? Yeah. I mean, there's, 
There has been a lot around drug treatment and drug intervention uh, and in London and across the country, which has been funded by the, through the government, through the Department of Health, and that needs to continue. We need to work out, you know, we need to act. It's, it's the public health approach, isn't it? It's actually why are people wanting to take drugs, what is it, and how do we treat that? But I'm sure you've also seen, and there's also an issue of, um, so it's sort of para paraphrased as um, the sort of middle class drug user, and the cocaine user that thinks it's okay, that it's a victimless crime. It's not. You know, it re you know we, how do we get that message across that actually, you know, there's some, I, I read a tweet which actually made me laugh, but it's, um, there's some people that are more concerned where their coffee comes from than where their cocaine comes from. So, you know, and it matters because there is very, very soon in that chain there is violence, there is exploitation and there is abuse. And there are people making money out of misery, and that really matters. So yes, I agree with you, and we will. Um, we need to think a bit more about that drug use and how we get that message home, and also how we treat and ensure that people, you know, it is an addiction. How how we can help those people not not need the drugs that are causing the harm, not just to themselves physically, but actually are causing are you know creating the violence in our streets. Okay, um, yeah, I'll go here for the front question. Um, so you mentioned how it's equally important to reduce violence amongst young women. What initiatives have been put forward to reduce violence for young women in London? Mm -hmm. There's, um, I'm always quite shocked when I read, the, when I read about the level of violence, uh, not just for young women, but women in London. We've, um, the Mayor's Office of Police and Crime did a sexual, a sexual violence needs assessment which showed the level of violence, sexual violence in London, um, which was quite shocking. And in terms of what can be done about that, there's a, it's, there's a number of levels, isn't there? Um, there are some really good programmes, uh, such as Safer London Run, around called the Empower Programme, which is funded, some of it, not all of it, is funded through the London Crime Prevention Fund that comes from the Mayor um, into boroughs, and they fund, fund programmes to to um, empower young women and to help, help them and support them in understanding what's happening to them. And I don't mean that in a patronising way, but actually in making the right choices from the, from what, you know, from the pressure to take, to take photographs and to, have to, to give them to their boyfriends or whoever they, you know, and for that photograph to, be, to understand what might happen when that photograph is, um, is shared and that, you know, what can happen there so that we, we fund some of that work through the London Crime Prevention Fund. But there's also, um, there's also quite a lot of work happening at the moment. And it, I know it's happening in Hackney with a fantastic academic called Carleen Furman around what's called contextual safeguarding, which is around thinking about where, where, it, where that violence or that abuse is most likely to happen. It does happen in the home, but in London it often happens on peer on peer, you know, young people to young people, or in public places. And actually, how do we work? to ensure that that safeguarding approach isn't just about the family, it is also about what is happening at school, on the way to school, in the shopping centre, uh, in, the, you know, in the local youth club as well. Um, and that, that work, is we, we, are, we are supporting that work, not always with money, but we are supporting that work through research as well. But then I, I also think, we might, you know, <laughs> I could go on for a long time on this, I also think, you know, you asked me what can the Assembly do, what can the Youth Assembly do, I think it would be fantastic to do some behaviour change around, you know, actually, this isn't just about, it not, this shouldn't be about young women being told to change their behaviour, this should be about all men, boys, being very, very clear about what is acceptable to change their behaviour. We have um, a pilot in Croydon with a secondary school and four primary schools, which is looking at what would a whole school approach be to tackling violence against women and girls, tackling sexual violence. That's in its uh, first year, and we're hoping that the, when that um, you know, comes to fruition, that it will have been successful so that we can roll it out, because we, we think schools are really important here. But if you as an assembly, it's about behaviour change, isn't it? It's about, again, it's about public health approach to either sexual violence or domestic violence. What is it that would stop it happening, as well as making sure that we support those young women that um, have been unfortunate enough to be victims of it as well? Thank you everyone for your questions and thank you so for your time. It's very generous and it's perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's some really, really incredible questions there, guys. But of course, the biggest question of all is what can we do? 
Does anyone have anything that they think that their borough does that they think would work really well across London? Does anyone want to share what their borough does? Yeah, hand your hands around. Right, so in my borough, like a couple of weeks ago, we went to this workshop, which was like a graffiti workshop. And I think a key factor that contributes towards youth violence is like free time and what people do within that free time. So I think that we could implement more workshops, more beneficial like things for young people to do within like London to actually prevent them from going on the streets and getting involved with things that they shouldn't be doing. Yeah, Emily? Okay. Uh, Katie, obviously you'll know this, but in Bromley, um, we're, we've been planning, um, and in December, we're holding a youth gangs conference. So what this is, is um, young people from across schools in our borough um, who are potentially at risk or vulnerable to becoming involved in gang activity are going to come to this conference and it's really about education and we're getting external providers to come and talk about um, either their experiences, their field of work and to really educate the young people at the conference. In Camden today, for example, we have a consultation going on with young people where young people have been invited to go um, and attend workshops with local stakeholders, the police um, and local community groups actually talk about some of the things that we think like are affecting them the most, things like mental health, um, especially like youth violence, and why it's or we think why young people, what young people think are some of the core reasons behind it having such a big rise recently in London. In our borough, we have a really high turnout of young people in youth centres, um, and lots of young people. Majority of the people you may find in these kind of like violent. Um, like scenes and things like that, they willingly show up to the youth centres. So our mayor wants to double the amount of youth centres in our borough. We currently only have four, um, but she wants to bump that up to eight because even though we have a high amount, we don't have a lot of youth centres. So I feel like targeting places where young people willingly want to go, such as youth centres, and offering things like opportunities like workshops and things like that will be um, a good way to engage with them because com conferences are a good idea and things like that, but Sometimes they don't really want to show up because it's like a formal event or something like that. So mainly we're trying to target it to areas that they do like to show up to willingly. Uh, yes, so in our youth council, currently we're promoting the work of youth zones. I'm not sure if you've heard of them, but they're sort of youth clubs and they're opening around London. And we were really keen on supporting these because, as you said, the, one of the main reasons why violence has increased because young people have nothing to do, they don't have inspiration, and places like Youth Zones can really help them do this. Also, tackling the root causes such as social isolation, and I think as a youth assembly, we can really use social media as a platform to tackle this and use our links with, um, whether with members of youth parliament or in our youth councils to really um, educate young people about these links. Yeah, and within my borough, we're very passionate about supporting our youth workers. So uh, the youth worker for my borough, Stephen Hutchinson, is a brilliant sort of support system that I think every youth needs because all of us have problems within our lives and then youth workers are there just to support us, whether it be the issues of if you're, going, if you're in gang violence to whether if you just have stress about your homework. And I think we need to focus on supporting our youth workers because they are unsung heroes of every community and I feel like they're very underappreciated in all the work they do whether it is in my borough or boroughs. Um, in Haverham, we've been working quite closely with our Over 50s forum to look at how the older generation have a very different perspective on these issues than we do and how we can learn from each other to better um, influence these issues and uh, improve them. That's fine. Um, so much like uh, some other people here, we have um, really good youth clubs and youth workers who've been working really hard with different young people. Um, they also go into schools. We have um, workshops in schools and colleges from um, the youth centres and also outside sources, um, like drop-in sessions and um, talks to young people. And um, in the recent uh, youth parliament elections, it's been in manifesto, uh, manifestos of many of the members, it's been a real focus, so I think it's also going to be a campaign. So we're doing campaigns and workshops and whatnot. Yeah, all right. um, So in our area, we focus on making them aware because that's a key problem for us. And so by do, we do that by make, making PowerPoints that the schools give out to other to students and make them 
understand that there is help out there for them and so and from that they it just gets passed on through like each um, year group and to other schools as well Luke? So in our borough, what we've been doing is recently we trained like, you know, mental health champions, what we call them. And um, something that I had recently was talking about how schools are kind of a center of communities now because all kids go to school and, you know, church isn't attended, things like that. Rates are going down. Um, and what I was going to say is like having things focus at school, you know, because you can't force people to attend youth clubs and, you know, many kids won't. But having something at school, a way to prevent that at school, just managing that within School. Okay, so workshops and learning is kind of coming out as a, a main theme. Is there anything that people think we could do that we could all kind of do as a general London thing that would work across all boroughs? Yeah, yeah. Um, so something that we haven't done, but I'm really pushing for, uh, my borough's in real need for reform and they're not pushing it as much as they should, is, um, sorry, um, <laughs> is the idea of getting these school police officers involved in every exclusion that happens in a school. Uh, last year, we had 44 exclusions every single day. This is 44 children who have a 60% chance of committing a crime. Um, that's the statistics for you, yet our school decides to still exclude them. Um, and what we're pushing for, we don't trust the schools to be making logical decisions on what's best for the child than rather than what's best for the school. In most cases, it's easier for them to just exclude and because of the not yet finished work of Ofsted, they're not getting judged on their ability to help a student out of that. It's more about their attainment. So what we're looking at and what I'm trying to push is getting every school, every school police officer involved in every school uh, exclusion to have the mind of the young person in their mind. So there will always be someone 100% looking out for that young person and their future. And I think that's something we can all push for by contacting our um, chief police officers or ward police officers and asking their opinions and how we can enforce that. That might be something we could all push towards if agreed upon. Yeah. In Waltham Forest, we've delivered a project called Street Base, which we hope to roll out um, five days a week in February. We got some of the mayor's funding for that. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer outreach project. So it's where we, um, as young people, will go out onto the streets in hotspot areas of crime and engage with other young people and hear what they want in the borough. And also in terms of signposting them to positive opportunities based on what they tell us their interests are. And it's something where we'd be building up a relationship with those young people and showing that we're here and ready to listen to what they have to say. I really like that. Is anyone doing anything similar? What do people think about that idea? Anyone? Yeah, Jeffrey? I think building relationships is a brilliant idea because within our borough of Hounslow, we're very close to our MP, Seema Mahotra, and we work very closely with her to, if we have a problem with that, we address it with her. And not only that, what Theo said, we need to work closely with the police because I think everyone's aware of the problem with the youth and the police. There's a fragmented relationship. And I believe the first step that we can all take is making the relationship between the youth and the police closer to so knowing who your local police officers are and getting to meetings like IAGs. Any police, just trying to get the youth involved with the police to make sure that we realise that there are a support system there that we just don't sort of see. When we think of the police, we think of that. We think of the big authority, the man, essentially. Um, so we, I think it's very important that we build a relationship, whether it is with your MP or whether it is with the police. Yeah, hello. Um, I very much agree that getting involved with the police and people in higher up positions and having them, having them feel like they care about young people is an important factor. <coughs> but I also, from what I've researched, is that factors that drive a lot of young people to commit crime is sometimes feeling like they lack a purpose within their society. So um, this isn't very borough specific, but I've done a lot of work with the NCS, with the National Citizen Service, um, which is a program where at the end you do a social action project and you work with your, within your community. And what's found is that a lot of young people, upon completing this challenge, they feel more, um, they feel more motivated to get involved with their society and do social action projects. So I think sometimes, as well as getting involved with higher up people, the problems can be more rooted than that and so getting involved within society and feeling um, active and like they have a purpose I think that can reduce crime very much as also as well. Um, so at the meeting which some of us around the table were at yesterday with Vicky Foxcroft um, it was discussed the possibility of a petition because Vicky Foxcroft Vicky Foxcroft, who has been leading on some of the efforts against knife crime and the Youth Violence Commission, um, has been trying to get a debate in Parliament about the public health approach 
but so far that hasn't been entertained. So, um, but there was talk about a petition, and so that would be a great way for us as a body to share and make sure that that petition gets a lot of um, exposure and assigned. Um, one thing that we're working on that will be applicable to all boroughs, um, because we've deliberately made generic, is a sexual harassment guideline specifically for teachers in schools. So we um, had a big conference and realised that most schools don't know how to deal with sexual harassment. Usually it's either um, handed over to the police if it's a really big incident or, um, or handled in a manner that we thought wasn't appropriate. And so we've put forward um, both preventative and, um, and then after something happened and long-term monitoring and it's a set of um, eight steps and we've made them simple and so that each school can use them. Um, so if uh, people are interested and if, there's, if we set up a method of communicating with all the barriers present, that can be passed on and you can see it um, about passing it on to all schools and making sure that it's implemented. The second thing that I don't think we've discussed yet is um, violence, particularly on online platforms, um, and looking at, say, sexual harassment again, and the rising of sending of nudes and the normality of it. And um, we've tried to lead, an, um, we've tried to have led an education approach, letting people know um, what a nude is, why it's illegal, how it can harm both the person who's taking it, and um, the rights of, of different people, and uh, making sure that it's brought up within each borough and that you held your own consultation or try to find the root causes of um, uh, nudes in particular. Um, yeah. yeah. I was just going to add to the point about sort of exclusions. I completely agree that uh, we do see loads of young people getting excluded and like um, this only member was saying earlier, we'd see a lot of young black people getting excluded. And I think I agree that we have to put more effort into discouraging schools from using exclusions as a first resort. But at the same time, we have to, I think we have to take into account that schools are under a lot of pressure and I can, I can see why they might see it as a means of protecting the well-being of other students. But I feel like you, you, you touched on something earlier, Theo, that I think could be a really good idea in terms of working specifically with the young people who are excluded. And I'd say possibly not with the police, but more working with some form of a role model or the targeted youth worker in that area to actually work with the young pe person who's excluded so that rather than them being excluded and spending all of their time alone and at home and being able and vulnerable to you know, being groomed into these activities, they're actually doing something productive with that time. Um, because otherwise, if the only contact that they're having with the police or with someone um, after being excluded is a negative one, it's just gonna sort of add to that cycle of reinforcement. And so we wanna sort of discourage it. And I think we have to do more and more to encourage role models to approach these young people and to go and work with and in schools to sort of um, end this sort of cycle of violence. Yes, um, every two years or so, um, Youth Parliament, where I'm from, we hold a youth forum um, and we organise it as on some sort of theme um, and then young people from schools and youth hubs are invited and it's all youth-led and youth-based. Um, we did one on sort of health, which was um, more about sort of sexual health and mental health for young people and at the forum we had um, representatives from the difference of things in our borough that help young people, like CHIPS, which is for um, sexual health young people. We had, we had um, representatives from CAMS. Um, and then we also had a play all about um, sexual health. And I think uh, you can use that sort of format, for, I think, for something like violence and um, youth violence, um, having some sort of youth-led forum, which we could um, create, that um, young, it's all young people, or mostly young people-led um, and young people orientated, um, where representatives can come and young people feel that they can have um, sort of a direct influence on both the organisation and uh, further steps after that. Okay. Um, so on what Sky said about having a youth forum where they can directly convey their interests and their messages to people in a position of power, in our borough we actually have a sort of assembly where young people, as I mentioned, we have a high turnout at the youth centres and youth zones. So our mayor has taken advantage of that and she holds, I think it's like a monthly assembly for youth in Newham where she will invite people in a position of power, let's say like um, someone who is in charge of policing in Newham or education in Newham to allow young people to directly convey their interests and their worries to that person in power and because she's the mayor herself and she's there we can directly 
control the forum and the direction that it goes in. So if our concerns are crime and things like that, we have had a meeting where we have directed our concerns towards her. So we know as young people that our message is directly being um, transferred to the mayor and people in power. With the group, we've actually arranged for there to be a football match between the police officers and teenagers around the area. <laughs> so cool. And that's going to be followed by a questionnaire which I think is going to allow for the teenagers to get to know the police more and they can ask them questions. It's going to bring them together and I feel like this is something that can be done in London. Maybe not a football match or maybe something like an activity that everyone can take part in and then have a questionnaire, uh, as a follow-up, a questionnaire so that people can get talking and share ideas and just feel more open. Trying to bring everything together, the kind of general things that have come out have been like peer outreach, police, and working with schools. So, how can we kind of like draw everything together into one thing that we can kind of work towards? What do you think about like having training up people as peer outreach work, peer outreach that kind of work maybe with police that go into schools and do things like that to kind of have like a almost uniform approach that we can all contribute something to? Would you, yeah, Luke. What I was going to say is, do we want to? Uh, before that, like, do we want to set up, like, you know, three or four goals for each thing which we want to all agree on and then say these are the exact things which we want to achieve and then we can, like, get into the nitty-gritty details? Yeah. Right. What goals, then? What do we all do? <laughs> yeah, Jatin. I think, uh, back to what I was saying, is that I think the main fundamental thing we need to improve is the relationship. So whether you're working to putting an end to knife crime or put, uh, supporting youth services, it's important that you need to have the relationship with the right people. And if you don't have that sort of strong relationship with your member of parliament, your um, MYP, or your London Youth Assembly member, it's going to be very hard for you to find change that you want to make. So if the youth of my borough have a problem, they know to come to me or to come to my MYP C of ES. But it's hard for boroughs that don't necessarily have a youth service as strong as Hounslow do, but it's important that we need to build a relationship, whether it be with the police, whether it be with members of parliament, or whether it be with just each other, because there's no stronger force than united people. Yeah, yeah. So at our borough, we actually had an event called the Public Living Room, where it was a chance for everyone in our community to come together and just chat and get to know each other. So that event helped actually, so the older generation stop viewing the young people in our community in a certain way, which adding on to what has been saying, uh, being said a lot is in order for us to start having a relationship with people who would actually help us move forward and improve um, life now in London, we have to come together as a community first and build relationships with each other before we do that. So I think that idea will be a good one to have in London and see. Yeah, so just trying to take out, I'm trying to write notes, I'm trying to consolidate what you lot are doing. I think a key point, as you, what was said over there, uh, from representative from Hounslow, is this idea of contacting police officers. I think a good step for us all could be to contact the police officers and letting, us, letting them know of a key word we're doing, which is engagement. I think that could be a really good priority. And a second one is what has been mentioned several times, but just recently there, is the idea of trying to at least get one event to reach out. So we've got that reaching to police officers, one reaching out to the community. So there's been a lot said about what our borough's already done, but it might be idea for us to go away from here trying to plan an event, what we can do in our borough. And a third thing we could do is it might be worth us, outside of these meetings, uh, going back in our sub-regional meetings and looking at how we can draft more specific suggestions about how we can deal with it in our regions. I think when it comes to actually creating an event for these young people that we should have something that would actually want, make them want to come. So some type of accreditation or actually a guarantee that they will get something out of this event instead of just saying, come have a chat with us. Because young people nowadays, they have lots of things <clears throat> on their palette and, like, and it's just having to actually get them into this event. So. Yeah. On Theo's point as well, making sure that not only... Uh, we have outreach with the police, but all of your boroughs most probably will have um, adult panels to do with safety, crime, making sure that you have one young member at least that attends meetings regularly, so you have a good relationship with them is key. And also um, maybe panels that you don't really consider, like uh, maybe if there's a prevent panel uh, for terrorism going along, making sure that your views are heard too. So trying to be involved as possible so that your face is well known or recognised in the adult council so you're more likely to have impact as well in terms of policy specifically. 
Uh, could it be a good idea if we take um, things like this back to our sub-regional um, meetings, just because I think it'd be more useful for us to like really talk things through, and it would be easier to do that in a situation like that rather than this wider meeting? Is everyone happy for goal number one to be engaging with our community, encompassing like the adult council, like the police, and that services? So we have that as goal number one. Yeah. yeah? yeah. Okay. Right. What about goal goal number two? Should we go two or three? Yeah, Luke. I think then we should move down. Like you know, with the votes, it was first of all crime, knife crime, and then it was mental health. I think that our next goal should just be mental health, just to put that out there. Do people want to carry on with knife crime? Are people ready to to move on to mental health? Anyone? <laughs> okay, so just to wrap up what, what we've kind of been saying. So I think the kind of key message that we've come up with is that we really need to, to make a difference, to engage with our community, to engage with the services that each and every one of us have the privilege of being able to use. So I think that as kind of like an action point for our, our sub-regional meetings is if each of us could go back to our boroughs and see what we can do pan London, what we can do together to make a difference, together your ideas from the young people in your boroughs and in our next sub-region meetings to really come up with some kind of strategy or plan that we can all kind of work towards together and combine across all four of our sub-regions to make a real difference. Does that sound like a good action point for everyone? Yeah? Okie dokie. So, moving on to our second topic, mental health, which was one that was really popular in the update forms we received from everyone and was also voted as the second top priority in the Make Your Mark with 24,827 votes. I'm sure we all know someone that experiences or has experienced difficulties with their emotional well-being. It's an incredibly tough experience for everyone involved and one that's only just starting to receive the attention it requires. Given that it's something that touches all of our lives, we all have a role to play in opening up the conversation, supporting those in difficulty and preventing them from reaching that place in the first place. The question is, what can we do? Does anyone have any projects that their borough does at the moment that they think would be really good to roll out across London? Yeah, Rihanna. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rihanna. So we recently had the mental health conference, which we found mm -hmm. to be successful because it was a chance for us to engage with people in our local community and just um, openly talk and challenge the whole concept of mental health and how there's this whole idea that you shouldn't talk about it and you should keep it to yourself. And the result of that was... Afterwards, there was people who left who actually were able to have information that they didn't know before on who to go to if they were experiencing difficulties with their mental health. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, mental health first aid, I think something that's an idea that I think I remember hearing coming out of this building in particular, but it's training young people and people who work with young people in um, spotting the signs of mental health. Uh, and how, how to help and educate young people to support each other because I feel like young people are better at supporting each other with regards to mental health than an external adult can ever be sometimes. Uh, yeah, so yeah. So Tower Hamlets works in partnership with mental health charities such as Time to Change and Step Forward um, and both of them come to uh, Tower Hamlets schools regularly and they promote their services such as free counselling and I think that's quite effective. Uh, yeah. Okay, um, so we had leaflets that were given out to each schools and they, we suggested to put them in like in toilets where it's more like secure because we found out that people like struggle to just in front of a teacher or in front of students say that they need help. So that was a way and we did see that people did take them and it did like bring like people felt the confidence that they needed once that wasn't there was now present and there was a key thing that helped them get somewhere. Uh, recently I've heard about this project where this sports uh, organisation, I'm not sure what it's called, they've taken a group of kids, teenagers, and essentially had them play some form of sport like basketball and then follow it up with a session where they discuss mental health and try and break down the stigma surrounding that. And over time it's progressively helping them, it's getting more people involved and gaining attention as well. So it's been useful. Um, we found that in a lot of the schools in our borough, with, um, with regards to the counselling services, if you didn't have a documented um, diagnosis of a mental health issue, it was quite stigmatised to go out and ask for help from um, the school counsellors. So 
um, the leader of my local council, she came in and she did a series of assemblies in a lot of the different schools, encouraging young people to reach out and ask for help if they felt that they needed it. And since then, and since this series of assemblies, we've seen a lot more people, particularly in the sixth form, feel more comfortable in going and asking for help. Um, so, our borough has a lot of initiatives, but something that I do as a member of the NHS Youth Forum is that I work with what the government has at the moment called the New Term Health Plan. And over the next 10 years, the government's going to be outrolling um, something over the, the whole of the NHS, so it doesn't cover private services. Uh, and to some extent, it is going to mean that some of our prescriptions are now going to have to be paid for. But something which does come off it, which is a benefit, is this idea of having mental health as its biggest focus. Uh, they've got a group of young people, including myself, and we're working directly with Man ha Matt Hancock. And we, together, we look at different initiatives we can have in enrolling out to not just different hospitals, but to different schools, including CAMS. Now, I've proposed something uh, with Youth Access, and it's called a Better Charter. It's this idea of having uh, a charter to rank mental health services against. And we're looking at having accessible walking clinics, not in school times. A massive problem for people who want to go see someone is this idea of confidentiality, consultation, and they go to school. It's not like they can not turn up to school and go see a mental health. Uh, CAMS has a waiting list time of sometimes even four years in the worst cases. And these are people who deal with it in other ways, including knife violence, including it because there isn't the support they're needed. So it's pushing initiatives with the new money that we have and over the upcoming meetings, I'll be taking your suggestions. Tomorrow I'm going to be heading off to York with the NHS Youth Forum and we're going to be discussing more there. So I'm going to be taking your feedback here and I'm going to be in telling them there and hopefully that can mould into this new term health plan and we can see what we can do from there. Thank you, Theo. Uh, yeah, Daisy? To link back with what was just said, um, our borough is quite uh, intent on looking at this middle ground in mental health because it often looks like we trivialise it or we look at it in extreme cases where we get so bogged down by criteria and diagnosis that we often think we have to have a set problem to be able to talk openly about our mental health. So our local youth council in Havering has been working quite closely for a few years now with a mental health app called Cypher and we've actually been involved in writing a book surrounding mental health um, to create an open conversation between teens about mental health without this constant criteria that's added in to make us feel pressured to conform to what we're expected to be diagnosed with, if that makes sense. Yeah. In Waltham Forest, we've got youth mental health ambassadors who have um, first-hand experience of mental health services or family members with experiences of mental health services. And they devised and delivered workshops in schools that were youth-led to young people, um, gathering their views on local services, what they liked, disliked, and how they'd improve them. And we went into PRUs, um, alternative provisions, and secondary schools in our borough to deliver these workshops. And based on the feedback, a report was created and like sent to the council boards and also fed into the transformation plan. So they've accepted a lot of the recommendations that were made by the young people. So it's a project that we were able to go back and tell the young people it, what you said made a real difference and will change like the statutory services we've got. I really, really like that idea. What do people think about that kind of, would that be feasible in your boroughs, do you think? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good idea, particularly combining it with the very, one of the first ideas of the mental health first aid training, to, uh, possibly those ambassadors, if they're specifically trained up for it, not only do they um, act as a point of contact and communication about their own experiences, but they can also provide any services. And um, I'm sure lots of people, they'll be happy to um, sign up. Um, but also, um, in terms of our borough, um, a long-term project we've had is collaboration with our drama centre to create a production. and. Um, it's been rolled out to schools multiple times and it works as a springboard for con conversation to take place. It's quite hard hitting and um, it discusses both um, what you can do as a friend to help, but also if you're experiencing it and uh, for teachers too. And um, so having um, often, if you have a creative form of expressing the idea, so it could be a video that you make, it doesn't have to be a play, but if there's uh, some um, visual cues or auditorial cues, then people might be more inclined to discuss mental health as well. Yeah, did you have something to add? Yeah, just in response to that, we've, um, all the youth mental health ambassadors were mental health first trained, so that when they went into the schools, they had the training prior to that. So that like, goes with what you said. 
Brilliant. Yes, Kai? Um, it was a big focus last year. Um, in youth Parliament was our mental health campaign, and we created a video, so it's quite connected to that. And we um, took it to um, the, uh, the cabinet meeting of our local council. Um, so that was direct contact with the council, and from that, um, they've created platforms through that. There's also a charity working um, with a couple of schools in Hackney called Safer Place, which has been created as a result of some bad things that happened in the last couple of years. Um, and that they created a quite an interesting thing, I think. Um, we did a series of concerts, um, and also, uh, so they had found lots of like local um, or like rising um, singers and rappers and spoken word artists. And what they did is they we had a week of concerts. Um, and then um, before then, um, during school time, and in connection with the local school, there was um, a discussion with these artists who all had some connection to mental health. And there was a discussion where students could come along, other members of the community could come along, um, and it was hosted. And they had a um, discussion about mental health and how they were feeling and what they thought was important and what was not important. And then there'd be a concert. So I think connecting, because um, obviously there's pop in pop culture, there's a lot of connection with music. I think connecting those two things was an interesting approach, and I think it worked quite well in getting the voice out there. Um, I think with this, we really need to consider how much we can feasibly do, because obviously with the LYA just starting up and all of us belonging to our own youth councils and stuff like that, um, if it feels as if we're trying to take on two priorities and that doesn't seem to me like it would feasibly work because of, I don't think we could do too well I think if we focused on just one, then it would be something that we could execute well. But if we focus on two, it might be damaging. People's thoughts on that, Luke? What I was going to say is about focus. My um, my suggestion was going to lead on to that. To have, you know, we know that mental health and knife crime are an issue, but especially in mental health, we don't know whether the issue is that young people are reaching out and they're saying, "Look, I have mental health problems," and they're not being listened to, or if they feel like there's nowhere they can go to say that or if they just don't have enough information. So I think that if we're going to try and do things, especially we need to be focused on our resources, we need to get surveys and know what young people need and want. Um, so two things. I, mean, I think um, mental health and knife crime are connected quite a lot, and I think having both as an objective would be quite useful. But I also think if, we're, if that's the sort of discussion we're having, we can go back to our count youth councils and go back to the youth where we are and ask them what do you want the focus to be on because from, where, from everything I've discussed these two factors are the main thing that young people want and I think if we, can, if we could focus on both of them I think that would be really positive because they do interlink quite a lot and I think you could create something around that. Yeah. I also think what's important to recognise is that as much as we may try to push for an understanding within our peers we also need to recognise that it may be difficult for us to seek help without in a way our parents approval because for us as young people that is what really does have an impact on us so i think we have to educate ourselves but also educate our parents and our relatives whoever has who've grown up with the stigma attached to mental health and break that down because i feel like our generation does not have any sort of stigma attached to it that we are accepting and that's a benefit but we must use that benefit to go ahead and educate the people who are now in power Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Emma. Um, I think there is still stigma, but not, not as much as before. But I think the main problem with mental health is that mental health. Is, many young people are educated about mental health, but they're not given practical solutions on how to solve it. So what we're doing in Arbor is we're trying to we're communicating with um, people who provide yoga services or other services like that to come into school so that they can actually give a practical solution because it's all good about educating and getting the ideas of young people but if you're not giving them where to go then that's pointless. Yep. Um, I think that like a key thing that we, that was like for, that raised in our area that was um, these like services don't have a lot of money and I think we know that in lots of departments there isn't a lot of money going around. So like raising some money like in our area we did that and it helped like give, give them resources which helped other people. I think that's a key thing because we always go back to the fact that money is a problem wherever we go <laughs> in our daily lives and that is a key thing and I think with more like money that goes to them we can like give like more help to the people who do need it. Within Alba, we're very sort of passionate about youth services 
And I think if we want to tackle knife crime and mental health, I think the best way is to support our youth services. So whether so, I spoke about youth workers, and they're very important um, when in working with youth services to make sure that it's a multi-functioning so sort of organisation. So if you do want to address mental health and knife crime, the best way is to do it that way because whether you do have problems with your homework and you have stress about it, you have your youth worker there to support you, and you have other groups. So within our youth centre, they're not just the youth council. There's other sort of groups to help deal with other issues. So I think if you do want to tackle multi-issues. Uh, funding youth services and supporting it is the best way because it's a multi-purpose sort of system. So if you want to put an end in knife crime, the, mo the main reason they go into knife crime is because they have no other option to do. So what the streets are basically, their they seem to be the last option. But if you give the early intervention of a youth centre, I think it would be very important to get them out of knife crime and then give people a support system where they can meet new people and meet new friends and then just sort of uh, bring up their well-being and work self-esteem. Um, one thing that was brought up was the money issue. And lots of people have um, said various names of charities, things that they've done. And um, if there's so many existing things that are available to us, then it'd be useful if we made like a master spreadsheet of everything that we each know as a borough of all the services available. It'd be quite easy to do a Google spreadsheet that we can all add to at the same time and view, where each borough lists any uh, charities that they're in contact with, projects that they've done, uh, people that uh, inspirational speakers that they think are good and initiatives so that way we've got a good a written record and that we can use to help each other out um, and make sure that we make use of anything that already exists before we start doing things because we might be repeating projects that are already ongoing and that would be a waste of our time and resources too oh, Emily, yeah. um, just back on to the link between knife crime and mental health I think that it's unfair to place such a heavy link on it because whilst I do see the interconnections between if you are a victim of knife crime, then it's likely that mental health plays a part in that. But when you consider the fact that one in four people in their lifetime will be affected by a mental health issue compared to the, I think, 50 people affected by knife crime, young people affected by knife crime this year, I think that it's not fair to say that they're so... Uh, inherently interlinked that we should focus on them together and I would like to reiterate the point that I think that we do need to come to a decision about which one we feel is the greatest priority at the moment. Um, in relation to that maybe we could split the group because there is quite a large proportion of us split the group focusing on knife crime and mental health so that way both issues are addressed, which are so currently inflicting on young people, and that way we can focus on them in a great matter of deal. What do people think on that? Yeah, honey. Really sorry to interrupt, but I have another event. Yeah. But I just want to say thank you, everyone. Um, I've had a really great time, and I can't wait for the next meeting. Thank you. Thank you for coming, honey. Thanks. Um, on the issue of uh, isolating the two things, um, lots of boroughs have done a lot of work on maybe one of the two issues already, so I've has done a lot of the things that have been discussed regarding the mental health and so for us say the mental health motion was put forward there would not be much that we would be able to do in uh, addition to that so having two means that each borough can choose which one is most feasible for them if we limit it right at the start then you could see that some boroughs actually struggle to implement anything at all so having two open means that boroughs can choose which one's easiest for them to do so there is some change but some change is better than none Absolutely. And I think it's worth emphasising at this point that part of the function of this body is about information sharing and sharing the resources that we have, like the work that you've been doing on mental health and how we can kind of share that across the different boroughs so that actually two priorities, it wouldn't be like you've got to do everything from scratch because you've got the brilliant work that someone else has done that you can see and how that can, can benefit you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so addressing that point, first of all, I'd just like to say, Luke, that in terms of sharing resources, uh, from some of the work that... Uh, I've seen from NHS Youth Forum, there is a lot of evidence already out there. And the answer is not straightforward in terms of is it the reaching out that have the problem or is it them reaching out and not getting spoken to? To the larger extent, it's them not reaching out and the steps tackled like that. But it's the resources out there and we're more than, like, people are more than willing to share that. Um, and I, I assure you, Emily, as well, there's more than 50 people affected by knife crime. Um, but I think there is a, a good point in the saying here that we could create two committees in terms of a knife crime committee and a mental health committee uh, where you don't have to be in either one or the other and it doesn't necessarily have to be meetings 
in here. Because obviously, as we've mentioned, we don't have the biggest budget. We have something called Skype nowadays, and it's great. Um, and it might actually be worth ha holding subcommittee meetings and having chairs of them, subcommittee meetings, sharing resources, asking, uh, like we have the notes saying, this borough did this. If they're not in the committee, could someone reach out to them, ask them for that resource, and have them initiatives going? What's your response? Yeah, Captain? I'm sort of on the other side of what Theo said. I think, again, what Emily said, that we need to focus on one priority. If all of us focus on one, then all the energies, that's the best way to solve it. And I think knife crime is an issue that's been pressed for the uh, past few months. The UK Youth Parliament are making their, that their national campaign, as well as the mayor's already introducing a violence reduction unit. But I feel like not, not enough being done to address mental health because it's such a big issue. And I think, yeah, you said one in four people are affected by mental health. And I think, as a group, I think we need to focus on mental health because I don't think it's getting the light it definitely needs because it's such a growing issue and I don't think it's being addressed by any politician directly. And I think knife crime's already getting its sort of recognition and its light, but I think mental health is still in the shadows a bit. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, what I was going to say is that if, if we're... Um, I think the... Just talking about like methods and how to how to actually facilitate the way of grouping. Um, I think that if if we do have, you know, like it, it doesn't matter if we do focus on one or two, that we need to have. I think everyone individually talk about it and say, okay, we feel like in our area we need to focus on this or this, so that then we can have it be like, you know, instead of you know how we have to do one or the other, we can kind of have a synthesis. I think we're kind of reaching a bit of a crux on this one or two. So I think we should take a vote on whether we should do one campaign or one priority or two. Uh, yeah, yeah, Gabby, did you want to? I just wanted to quickly mention something. The actual topic of knife crime, it, knife crime itself is actually really, really specific. And even then, something like knife, like knife crime, I feel like it's more associated with like youth <laughs> violence. That would be a broader topic to focus on, I feel like. OK, so I think we should take an initial vote on whether we think we should do one priority or two. So, all those in favour of doing one priority, put your hand up. One, two, three, four. Okay, and those in favour of doing two priorities, hands up. Good. Hands up. Is that 19? And did anyone want to abstain? Okay, so I believe that was a majority for two campaigns? So. Okay, so now the focus on what those two campaigns are. Are people happy with kind of youth violence as like an un umbrella term? Is that kind of what people are thinking? Yes, okay. And mental health as the second one? Yeah, do people think those, are people happy with those as the two main priorities? So I guess in terms of action points for the next sub region meetings is for us to come up with different things that we think we can do as a whole on those two focuses, whether we want to have the committees or whether we all want to work on them together. Yeah, sorry, Abu. Well, I just want to ask. I feel like we could call it, we can call it the focus on youth finance, but I feel like the terminology here could actually be quite important in terms of how we define this because, of, yes, we are sort of looking at the issue of violence amongst young people, but I feel like it could be better to sort of brand it under a different term because we're not necessarily just looking at how to prevent violence, we're looking at how to change the way that we deal with young people who are who are vulnerable and who are pro, who are sort of more likely to go down this path. And I feel like necessarily maybe not violence, but we can look at different terms necessarily to look at it. I maybe mean, for example safety or you know Okay, youth safety. What yeah, Luke? Definitely based on, on his point is that we, we need to have like clear aims and we need to have clearly defined with all the wording 100% nailed out so we know exactly what we want to do so that we can then go back and have an idea and everyone you know knows what we're doing. Yeah. In terms of a name, uh, safeguarding, uh, so that would be uh, both preventative and after um, as a name. Emily? I think safeguarding has other connotations because particularly if you can like schools, safeguarding can be to do with a lot of things like grooming and... Um, just a lot of issues, like even to do with like child abuse and stuff like that. So I think stay, safeguarding would be something to steer clear of because it does have some very specific connotations. Um, I think the idea of bringing youth safety into it is important, but I think um, having both the main title, maybe like youth violence and safety, because then that um, that clearly defines what we're saying. Because we're not just looking at 
safety measures, which may, because again, it's all about wording, as you say, um, about connotations about what that means, but it shows that we're focusing both on what's actually happening, how to prevent it, and the wider community. I think having both in the title would be good. I also think when we choose whatever we want to call these topics that we will focus on, we need to be careful with what exactly, because if we want to tackle knife crime head on, then we should name it knife crime. But if we want to make it a more broader issue, then we should make sure that the terms we use are more vague. And it also allows us, when we do think about the connotations, to sort of spread out what we look at. So what are people thinking? Do we want to go straight knife crime? Do we want to go violence and safety? Do you want to vote? Do you want to vote on that? Okay. So all those in favour of calling our campaign knife crime? No. Okay. And those in favour of uh, violence and safety? Okay. Is that everyone else? Did anyone want to abstain? Yeah. Okay. But that was an overwhelming majority for violence and safety. And in terms of our second one, in terms of mental health, do you want to call it mental health, emotional well-being? There's quite a few different terms that have been used. Yeah? I'd obviously like to put forward again, if not changing it uh, to, uh, for mental health, but putting it as youth services, because I think youth services is a multi-purpose youth organisation. I think that's where we should put our time. And I think we, if we, there are so many issues within London that we need to focus on. And I think if we put youth services forward as our initiative, I think we can address different problems, including mental health. And I think it's, again, it's an umbrella term. If you want to put, if you push youth services as an umbrella term for mental health, knife crime and other issues. I take what you're saying, but I think that is very, very broad in terms of youth services. And if we kind of want to focus on two main areas, then maybe we should be a little bit more specific because if people are kind of looking at the London Youth Assembly and they see youth services, they wouldn't necessarily know straight away what we're working towards. So, we'll, Emily, yeah? I think then we also have the issue of if we're campaigning for youth services, it directly links to funding, and that's not something that it limits us because all we could really do is then lobby the government. We can't take any action ourselves, I don't think. Uh, yeah. Um, I feel like actually in this case, like mental health is a good like base term to have definitely in there because the whole life, the whole thing of mental health is always there. It does exist a stigma, and then if you start to avoid the term mental health, then it sort of panders to that stigma in a way. Yeah, Scott. Um, it's just as, it's as a suggestion, it could be mental health and well-being because I think that yeah. overwhelms with overwhelms um, contributes with both um, just actual the, like it sort of st takes away from um, just being like if you have a. Um, mental illness to just general well-being and that's more the preventative side as well leading into each so Daisy yeah I'd like to just sort of concur with what you said Katie and also you Sky I think by calling it mental health I acknowledge the fact that it might kind of be pandering to people who specifically think of mental health as a set thing but I also think we need to be quite clear about we're not trying to exclude anyone who doesn't have a diagnosed problem. We're trying to look at it as a whole. So I think well-being ensures that we're not excluding anyone and we're not saying that you have to fit a criteria. Do we wanna, are people happy with mental health and well-being? Do we, do we need to vote on that? Are people happy? <laughs> yeah, mental health and well-being? Okay, fabulous. So people, I think we've got our two priorities then for the year. So I think for in terms of our next sub-regional meetings, I'd like to take this opportunity to say a big thank you to Westminster, Walton Forest, Hounslow, Wandsworth and Lambeth for hosting the first sub-regional meetings. We really appreciate you taking the time to do that. And if anyone would like to volunteer to host the next sub-regional meeting to either email Georgie or to email the LYA chair email address, that would be brilliant. So I guess those meetings will focus on those two topics and if people will go back to their boroughs and see what kind of things that you've done already or how can they be enhanced that we can do it as a group and as a collective together and have that kind of discussion in those meetings about what we can bring to this table soon so that we can kind of come up with something as a collective, a collective vision or something that we can work towards. So in terms of our next dates, we're looking at having the next one of these meetings in either February or March, and we've got four dates that we're going to send out for everyone to kind of check the diaries and get booked in. So that's just kind of to let you know in advance that we're looking at February, March, and we'll get some uh, dates sent out to you shortly. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of the date and the times, mm -hmm. uh, one thing that we identified 
um, was that because it's a school day, many people from the outer London boroughs actually struggle to get here on time. Yeah. So uh, pushing back the meeting even half an hour would be greatly appreciated. Okay. But also the fact that we meet very few times a year, I think four times a year, um, looking at perhaps even doing it on a Saturday um, or um, making use of a holiday, um, especially because the meetings are so long, um, there's no reason why that can't take place one Saturday in the whole half term. In the whole term, is not unfeasible. Yeah, definitely. <coughs> just in terms of general, yeah, sorry, Nick. Just wanted the the two goals reiterated clearly, just so I can write them down and make sure that everyone also hears the most goals, so we know what we're doing. Yeah. Okay. So our first goal that we kind of came up with was engagement, and that was about the violence and safety. And our second one was about championing mental health and well-being. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, fabulous. Um, so we'll get those dates sent out as soon as possible. If you can, guys can just check and just let us know as soon as you can when it's best for you guys. And I'll just take this opportunity to plug the Twitter. Um, if you don't follow us already, it would be great if you did that and if you could share that amongst your young people and youth councils and different services so that we can kind of really spread our message about what we're doing. And also, just in case anyone didn't know already, we also have our web page, which is up and running. So we'll put like the minutes and things up there, and so like you can always look for the agenda. That will always be there, and that's on like the City Hall website. If you Google that, or if you just Google London Youth Assembly, it will come up. Um, so that kind of, I think, is everything. So I just want to say a massive thank you to you all for being here and for committing your time to being part of the London Youth Assembly and to committing to making this difference. It really has been really special to be able to see you guys here. This has been a long journey to reach this point, and it's been really, really brilliant. So thank you all very, very much for your time. And also just to say another massive thank you to all the GLA staff for allowing us to use this building and for all their help in facilitating this meeting. So I think that brings this meeting to a close. Thank you, everyone.